Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Susan Bennett from Total Work Health and Safety, and um, I do workplace safety, which is explanatory from my business name. I've worked with all kinds of companies, manufacturers, transport, disability services, a lot of trades, and I, there isn't a particular industry that I focus on, but I do more work with more than uh, some more than others. Um, the people in this room here um, probably don't need a lot of, uh, well, they're classified as less hazardous or less risk in the way, in words of safety. So the basic things that I've got on our, our checklist here, some of them do actually, uh, well, they do all apply, but to varying degrees, depending on what your enterprise does. So basic thing is, have you got a work health and safety policy and are your workers aware of it? So if you have one of those and it's sitting on a shelf and nobody knows about it, it's useless, you may as well just use it in the toilet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important that your people know that you care about their safety. So by having a policy and including that in, in say your induction when you get engaged in your people is a really good way for them to see that you actually do care about their safety. And in relation to safety inductions, so um, that's the kind of thing like your, where's your meal rooms, um, how do you apply for leave? And safety is a huge part of that. With the people who say, for example, in your um, escape rooms, so things that you might perhaps think of are, are you going to get people coming in who are a bit under the weather with alcohol or drugs? And how are you going to deal with that safety wise? If you're in the IT um, area of things, so I'm not sure whether you do any cabling and things like that. So there may be items like that that your people need to be aware of. Um, in travel, I'm not sure really about the, the safety aspects of travel, probably more the safety of how you're going in your office. So if you've got an ergonomic setup workstation and things like that. And another important thing is, do you have incident accident reporting procedures, including where to find the forms? So people sometimes have these, um, sometimes they don't, but it is important that people are encouraged to actually fill out your report forms, but they need to know where to get them. Mm -hmm. Generally, um, I advise that in a meal room, you have a notice board and you have a section which has got work health and safety and you can just put blank copies there. And reporting processes for hazards, which is really important. So if you've got a hazard, which is someone finds it and they don't do anything about it or they don't tell anybody else about it, that hazard might actually turn into an incident itself. By having encouraging hazard reporting, then you're actually getting a picture of what's going on because one person might see it and then someone else sees it. And then you can find out what's going on. Is it uh, um, some kind of an issue with procedure people aren't doing the right thing um, maybe something actually doesn't work and people that don't want to for whatever reason don't want to say anything but if you get a reporting process going then you can get, get a picture of what's going on and you can actually solve it before it turns into a bigger issue and another thing is emergency evacuation plan so that's an actual diagram uh, there's an Australian standard for those you don't have to go down that, that full path unless you, you really feel that you need to. It's a diagram which basically says these are the exits, these are the fire extinguishers, these are your first aid kits and the way you get out if there's an, an incident where you need to, to be, evacuate. And a lot of people have a drawing, but they've got no idea, nobody knows how to actually coordinate it. So warden training is a really good idea and even how to use fire extinguishers. Most people don't even know what it feels like to pick up a fire extinguisher. They can be quite heavy and actually what it feels like to use it on a fire. So I actually provide training in that and it's, it's quite interesting. People just love that part of it. They all love to put <laughs> out fire. Fun, Susan. <laughs> it is. It brings out, and brings as out a, a bare maniac in you. <laughs> oh, it does. It does. <laughs> Um, I actually have a factory in uh, Marrickville and one of the guys insisted on, he wanted to turn the gas off and on. That was his little job. And he was so excited that I said, mate, you need to have a turn and actually put the fire out yourself now. He, he took over, but that was funny. And um, as a minimum, you need to have a evacuation, emergency evacuation drill once a year. So that's however you alert people that you're going to um, 
how you, you get out. So you might have an a, a air horn or you might have a PA and you announce however you work, you work that how that goes. So once a year, you need to have everybody assemble at the emergency evacuation point and then you time how long that takes and did everybody come out? Did anybody wander off into the blue to get a coffee while they were waiting for the rest of the people to get out? All those kinds of things you need to examine so that if there is actually a real emergency, you know it's going to work. And, and Susan, as part of what you do with your clients then, uh, because it's easy for them to either forget to do that or not have the processes to remind them, uh, is that something that you have some sort of way to remind them or, or re-engage once a year to do that and other presumably other things during the year? So when I provide a safety management system for my clients, I set a, a schedule for the various things that you need to do in, in safety. And I encourage them to put them into their calendars, whether it's Google or Outlook or something like that, just as their own reminders. But I actually do have a time frame for all kinds of things that they need to do to meet legislation requirements and things like this as well. Yes. Okay, good. So another one that most people don't know, uh, Safe Work New South Wales, it's requirement that you have a poster displayed in your workplace if you get injured at work. So that just talks about the return to work process for your organisation. And on the bottom of it, it's, it has where you can put the name of the person to talk to about that kind of thing. So that's a requirement. To over to that quickly? Yes, yes. Uh, where are we? That's this one here. Yeah. Right. So you just print that out, pop it on your notice board. You might like to um, communicate it via an email to everybody. It's up to you, but you actually are required to display that. Mm -hmm. So anybody who gets hurt knows what the steps are to help them. And, this is and it's, that's um, State Insurance Regulatory Authority right. have, have created that one. Yeah, so it talks about your workers' comp insurer and who your return to work coordinator is. And oftentimes the return to work coordinator is associated with your insurer anyway but you would just talk to a particular person in your organisation as the first step. Another one that a lot of places don't actually do is electrical testing and tagging. And it doesn't matter whether you have a high risk construction type job, you've got a factory or you're in an office, you should have your things tested and tagged. So obviously if you're in an office, then it's gonna be less risk for the, the electrical leads and equipment to become damaged. So there's a, a longer period. So if you've got, a television, it's five years, and it's similar for computers. And you must also include items that are in your meal room, so microwaves, fridges, all, mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. And first aid kits, a lot of places have first aid kits, and part of a site inspection that I do is I actually look at people's first aid kits and see what's in expiry dates. So you'd be surprised bandages have them, uh, Band-Aids have an expiry date and I find all sorts of wonderful things in first aid kits that shouldn't be there. I've had um, smelly foot powder. I've had um, like batteries. I don't know why batteries are in first aid kits. So I found all sorts of things. And a little hint, if you have a first aid kit, by law you must not put Panadol, Nurofen or any of those kind of products in there because unless you have a qualified medical person, so a doctor or a nurse, then you can't actually have them in there because you might, by giving someone those or having them in there, might be masking a more serious health um, problem and that could have serious consequences. So you just don't put them in there and you always tell your workers that if they want to do have their own, that's fine, but they keep it in their own personal space. They don't put it in the first aid kit. And another thing I often find in people who don't actually check their kits very often, tubes of Savlon and disinfectant and things like that, these days definitely not because of cross-contamination, single-use sachets, and you can get them anywhere. Mm. And you don't have to go and spend $300 on a first aid kit from a company that specialises in those. You can get a, a, a nice um, toolbox. You can get them from Bunnings actually with a first aid. They're plastic or you can get uh, metal ones. And you just go and fill them up. Mm -hmm. You can, um, I mean, if anybody needs lists 
for contents for first aid kits, just send me an email. I'll send you a list of what you need from your kit. And then you can go to Woolies and get your Band-Aids or, or wherever you want to get, go and get them. And scheduled regular safety inspections of your workplace. So that's taking a look around to see what hazards you might have. So obviously in a, a factory, there could be machinery, there could be moving forklifts. In an office environment, one that I see all the time is people have all these leads running around the floor and oftentimes under their desk and they can get tangled up in their chairs or their feet and they can trip over, things like that. Um, another common one in offices is if you've got things that you don't look at very often, you may have archive boxes and you store them high up on shelves. There's actually a manual handling problem when people are trying to access those things. They might be too heavy to lift up or down. And even um, chairs, people have some really bad chairs at times that don't wheel properly. And even things like if you've got a photocopy, you shouldn't actually have your people sitting too close to it either because it has fumes and, and um, the actual chemicals in the, the toner cartridges are not very good for you either. Mm -hmm. So that's something to think about. And we all get contractors in. So a contractor, for example, would be the person who comes in and does your electrical testing and tagging. You might have someone who comes in and tests your fire extinguishers or cleans your air conditioners, all those kinds of things. So you actually have a legal responsibility for anybody who comes into the workplace, including your contractors. So as a minimum, you need to ensure that they are actually qualified for what they do. So if you're getting an electrician in, ask for the copy of their qualifications also their insurances because if they're not insured they get hurt in your workplace then they can actually sue you and you will you will possibly be liable for um, looking after them legally which I'm sure Julie would be able to confirm um, yeah so you just got to be very careful and any anyone who comes into your workplace whether your clients um, any kinds of visitors work experience volunteers they're all covered on the work health and safety legislation and you have responsibilities to to look after their health and safety excellent so susan um we uh can i share this with others or can yes of, us... of course feel free okay. right. yeah anybody who wants it that's fine yeah great and then uh once once they complete this they can obviously have a chat to you if they want to uh go through if, they, if they've highlighted yeah, i'm happy to give give advice not a problem yeah happy to if anyone's got any questions just give me a call or shoot me an email i'm happy to answer them great any questions for susan all good excellent no, i must great. have done a good job <laughs> <laughs> well i think it's a fantastic sure. way to just uh you know it's a nice simple checklist that we can share with our clients i mean i'm happy to share this uh and uh, yeah, it's 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 nice and simple thing for them to go through. So can I just ask, yeah, Susan, are there any updates to the uh, work health and safety policies around COVID and vaccines and and this checklist? So that's why I didn't include it on there specifically. That changes almost by the day. Okay. Um, so. I recommend clients, and I can I can send you uh, links if anybody's interested. I can send you the links. Oh, to I would the, like them. The... Okay, all right, I'll send that to you. Um, Safe Work Australia is the site that I refer to, and I've even um, there's even some really good resources from I think it was Business Australia, because now the issue is can you ask your people to be vaccinated or else they don't have a job and encouraging your people to get a vaccination. So there's all sorts of things available there as well. Yeah, we um, chat about oh, this last. So Julie, if you... <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll send you an email with those links. Yeah, and I'll communicate with you outside here because we're putting uh, together a little legal guide for business owners mm -hmm. and um, might, yeah might put a section in from you. Sure, yeah, that's your, fine. Have on your links that. and stuff, because, you know. Hmm. Good thing to do. Good stuff, excellent. Um, yes, Thanks for Happy that, to help. Uh, Susan, it's great.